Nightly Business Report. Good evening. Tonight, 3% target seems to be what Sri Lanka can achieve economically this year, says the central bank. Petroleum regulated to come into place after the government approves the body. Management of the slow-moving Matale International Airport handed over to Russia and India. Electric cars electrifies at the Beijing Roadshow. From Studio 24, here's Sina Mayadune. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The central bank said that Sri Lanka's economy is expected to grow by 3% in 2024 after it reduced interest rates amid easing inflation. This comes as the country navigates its escape from its worst financial crisis in decades. Sri Lanka's economy contracted 2.3% in 2023 after also shrinking the previous year. The country plunged into its worst financial crisis since independence and saw the foreign exchange reserves fall to a record loss in early 2022. While releasing the annual economic review, the central bank said that Sri Lanka has not fully exited the crisis and that there is no space available for any slippages from the committed path. However, the central bank lowered interest rates in March in a bid to prioritize growth after keeping its policy rates unchanged in January to tame inflation. Earlier this month, the government rejected a proposal by international bondholders to restructure more than 12 billion US dollars in debt, delaying efforts, but has pledged to resume negotiations. According to a report it issued yesterday, the central bank further said it is paramount that the country stick to its extended fund facility agreement with the International Monetary Fund and complete its debt restructuring processes. Sri Lanka's legal draftsman has been instructed to draft a bill on criminal asset recovery. Cabinet spokesman Bandulu Gunavardhana announcing the decision said that the legal draftsman has been in instructed to prepare a bill based on the recommendation of the expert committee appointed to study the policy, legal framework and procedure required to recover the proceeds earned from the crime. The International Monetary Fund required that Sri Lanka introduce a comprehensive law on the recovery of criminal assets by 2024 in return for its comprehensive loan facility. <music> Minister Bandulu Gunawardhana said the cabinet has approved appointing a panel to draft a law establishing a petroleum regulator. The regulator will cover liquefied petroleum gas, petrol, diesel, kerosene, aviation fuel and lubricants. Gunavardhana told reporters today that the committee headed by the Secretary to the Energy Ministry will draw up the legal framework. Energy Minister Kanchan Vijay Sekara said on X that the Cabinet of Ministers approved the proposal to establish a regulator for the energy sector. PUCSL will remain as the electricity sector regulator and a new regulator will be introduced for the petroleum, LPG, LNG, lubricants, oils and energy sectors. <music> Foreign Minister Ali Sabri is scheduled to leave for Riyadh, Saudi Arabia to attend the World Economic Forum special meeting on global cooperation, growth and energy for development which will be held in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia from the 28th to the 29th of April this year. Convened by the World Economic Forum, the special meeting in Riyadh is expected to bring together the leaders from diverse sectors and industries to inspire a comprehensive dialogue on the most urgent and complex issues of the day. The Minister of Foreign Affairs said that during the visit, Foreign Minister Ali Sabri will join as the panellist in two sessions, namely Building the Urban Future and North to South, East to West, Rebuilding Trust. On the sidelines, the foreign minister is expected to have bilateral meetings with his counterparts from a number of countries including Saudi Arabia, the host country. The minister will also meet the Sri Lankan community in Riyadh and visit the Sri Lankan International School. State Minister of Finance Ranjit Sambalapitiya says state revenue reached an impressive 834 billion rupees in the first quarter of this year. This achievement not only surpasses the projected revenue, but also indicates a growth of 6%. The Minister emphasized that the prudent financial management and a consistent revenue pattern, the current year promises to be a year of successfully attained revenue targets. Simbala Pitya made these remarks during a press briefing yesterday at the Presidential Media Centre on the theme Collective Path to a Stable Country. <laughs> Punna Vartanavila. 
However, we have had a rise in social welfare and recurring expenditures. That's why I said that after a very long time, this is the time that we are actually regulating our economy. We need to ensure that our expenses match our income. If not, what we used to do was spend what we earn. And then we try to find the balance from another source. If we do that again, then our financial management lapses. We no longer have that a joint venture between Russia and India will now take over the management of the second international airport of Sri Lanka, the Matal Rajapaksa International Airport. Announcing the decision, Cabinet spokesperson Minister Bandal Gunawardana said that five parties did submit and a joint venture was selected. Minister Gunavardhana said that the cabinet approved the decision to award the management of the airport to the Russia-India joint venture on a 30-year contract. The companies were named Shaurya Aeronautics Private Limited of India and Airports of Regions Management Company of Russia. The Matal International Airport has struggled to attract regular traffic even after a raft of special concessions were offered for international airlines operating from the airport, including discounts on the landing and parking charges. Ports and Aviation Minister Nima Siripala de Silva told the Parliament in December that the airport's losses were reduced by 30%. Let's take a short break and on the other side, all the data from the Stock Exchange. This is the Nightly Business Report. And let's take you straight to the stock market. The Colombo Stock Exchange ended the working week on a positive note, marking gains throughout the week. The All Share Price Index rose more than 1%, while the S&P SL20 also gained over a percentage point. Let's get a breakdown of how the markets performed, and for that, standing by tonight is Kanushka Jayatese from ST Securities. Yes. In today's market, the All Share Price Index closed at 12,201 points, marking a 125 points increase, while the S&P SL20 ended at 3,643 points, showing an increase of 49 points from the previous session. Total trading volume reached 198 million shares with a turnover of 4.1 million rupees. The top five gainers for the day were Vaskadu Beach Resort Rights, Industrial Asphalt, Blue Diamonds Jewelry Worldwide, Tessagra Non-Voting, and SMB Leasing. The top five losers for the day were Paragon Loan, Hikadu Beach Resort, Singha Hospitals, Sarvodhya Development Finance, and Ceylon Hospitals Non-Voting. Notable crossings include Haley's with 3.8 million shares trading at 317 million rupees, John Keel's Holdings with 1 million shares trading at 218 million rupees, People's Leasing and Finance with 9 million shares trading at 109 million rupees. The positive sentiment throughout the week brought some good news for investments in the country. Although debt restructuring efforts were neither here nor there, the indices brushed off that uncertainty throughout the week's trading. In order to understand this sentiment in depth, we spoke to Rasita Pereira from SC Securities. Yes. This week, the All Share Price Index and S&P SL20 Index recorded a substantial upward movement, powered by strong investor sentiment over strengthening macroeconomic factors in the country. The All Share Price Index closed at 12,204 points, recording a 3.8% rise. The S&P SL20 Index closed at 3,643 points, with a 5.6% weekly gain. The average daily turnover was recorded at 2.7 billion, with an average shares traded volume of 165 million shares both indicators rising substantially week on week. The weekly top gainers were Singer Finance, Singer Sri Lanka, LOLC Holdings, Browns Investments and LOLC Finance, followed by strong gains in banking sector shares. Moving on to sector-wise performance, banking and non-banking finance and diversified conglomerates were the investor favourites during the course of the week. Gold prices rose in Asian trading today as signs of a cooling U.S. economy fed some demand for the yellow metal. Gains were limited in anticipation of more rate cut cues from the key inflation data. 
The yellow metal was also set for steep weekly losses after tumbling from a near record highs over the past five sessions as traders largely priced out expectations for early U.S. interest rate cuts. Spot gold rose 0.2% to $2,335.86 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in June rose 0.2% to $2,335.68 an ounce. Bullion prices saw some relief after the dollar fell tracking softer than expected gross domestic product data. Oil is headed for a weekly gain ahead of U.S. inflation data, which may give further clues on the path forward for monetary policy. This data may also shape the appetite for risk assets, including commodities such as crude. Brent rose above $89 a barrel and is up more than 2% for the week, while West Texas Intermediate was near $84. The Federal Reserve's preferred inflation figure is due later today, coming hard on the heels of data showing weaker U.S. economic growth. Other gauges of price rises in the U.S. remained hotter than expected, suggesting the time of rate cuts may be pushed back. The rupee continued its upward trend in days trading today against the dollar as the central bank put the buying rate of the dollar at 291 rupees and 87 cents while the selling rate was set at 301 rupees and 21 cents to the dollar. The banks followed suit as commercial bank the buying rate of US dollar dropped from 291 rupees and 24 cents to 289 rupees and 83 cents. And the selling rate also dropped from 300 rupees and 50 cents to 299 rupees and 50 cents. Now here's a look at how the rupee performed against other currencies during the day today. Another break now and when we return, the latest from the corporate world. This is the Nile Business Report. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Nile Business Report. President Ranil Wickremesinghe on Wednesday integrated the Nihon Bashi Japanese restaurant situated within the premises of Colombo Port City. During the opening ceremony, the president took a tour of the restaurant, engaging in friendly conversations with the attendees. The first of its kind, Nihon Bashi, was originally established in 1995 at Golfes Terrace by renowned chef Darshana Munidasa and has since been a prominent destination for both local and international patrons seeking authentic Japanese cuisine over the last 29 years. Notable figures such as President's senior advice on national security and the chief of staff to the President Sagal Ratnayaka were also present to mark the occasion. The 4 A's Advertising Festival, powered by Unilever Sri Lanka and globally connected by Sri Lankan Airlines, is gearing up to a transformative event for the advertising and creative industry this May. The 4 A's Advertising Festival, happening at Taj Samudra Colombo on the 30th to the 31st of May, along with its accompanying awards. The festival promises to be a remarkable milestone for Sri Lanka, making this event highly anticipated and significant for the local advertising and creative community. The two-day learning festival is designed to serve as a source of new ideas, innovation and inspiration. Kaspersky, the global cybersecurity and digital privacy company, announced its expansion into new territories in Asia-Pacific, including Sri Lanka, Cambodia and Bangladesh. This strategic move marks a significant milestone in the company's mission to fortify digital infrastructure across the developing economies in the region, particularly on the enterprise cybersecurity market. As cyber threats continue to evolve and proliferate worldwide, 
Kaspersky recognizes the imperative of extending its holistic suite of cybersecurity solution services to emerging markets in Asia Pacific region. The managing director for Asia Pacific at Kaspersky said that the expansion into Sri Lanka, Cambodia and Bangladesh reflects their solid dedication to safeguarding the wider cybersphere of the Asia Pacific against the increasingly complex landscape of cyber threats. Kiehl's Food Products PLC is delighted to announce the launch of the Elephant House range of sausages into Australia's vibrant culinary landscape through an esteemed partnership with the Millennium Imports Proprietary Limited. This partnership is a first for both Elephant House and the Millennium Imports as this range is being fully manufactured in Australia with 95% of raw materials being sourced from the continent itself. This partnership with Millennium Imports will bring the Elephant House taste to both the Sri Lankan community and the broader Australian market, fostering a legendary culinary experience that transcends borders. Octave, the Data and Advanced Analytics Centre for Excellence of the John Kills Group, is pleased to announce its recent strategic partnership with the University of Keradinia in Sri Lanka. This collaboration marks a significant step in the ongoing efforts to forge strong ties with the top tier academic institutions, particularly with the Department of Computer Science and Engineering and the Faculty of Science of the University of Peradeniya, which holds the distinction being the country's oldest university. As a part of this collaboration, Octave will work closely with the University of Peradeniya to enhance and strengthen its curriculum related to data analytics, specifically focusing on data science, machine learning and data engineering. Octave will also provide the talented and enthusiastic undergraduates of the university internship opportunities. We'll take a quick break and when we return we have more global business news. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Now, most stocks rose today, buoyed by gains in the technology sector. Investors cheered strong earnings from Microsoft and Alphabet, although anticipation of more cues on interest rates kept sentiment in check. Japanese stocks picked up pace after mixed signals from the Bank of Japan's cast doubt over just how much capacity it had to raise interest rates further. Japan's Nikkei 225 index added 0.7%, while the broader topics rose 1%, with both indices extending gains. The South Korean Kospi index rose by 1%, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng index added 2%. Meanwhile, India's Nifty 50 rose slightly, although traders were wary of heightened volatility in the Indian market as the 2024 general elections began. Wall Street stocks closed lower yesterday as markets were stunned by data showing slower than expected U.S. economic growth and persistent inflation, coupled with a sell-off in large cap stocks triggered by disappointing results from meta platforms. U.S. stocks closed lower Thursday as U.S. economic growth came in softer than forecast and inflation remained persistent. The Dow dropped about 1%. The S&P 500 slipped roughly half of 1%, and the Nasdaq lost two-thirds of 1%. Data on Thursday showed the economy grew at its slowest pace in nearly two years in the first quarter, while the pace of inflation accelerated to a level well above the Federal Reserve's 2% target. That dampened hopes the Fed would begin cutting interest rates this year. Technology stocks fell on Thursday following a disappointing forecast from Meta Platforms. But after the closing bell, Microsoft and Google parent Alphabet posted strong results that could set the sector up for gains on Friday. Other stocks on the move included Caterpillar. Shares lost 7 percent after the company cut second quarter sales forecasts as demand for its construction equipment eases from last year's boom. And shares of Southwest Airlines fell about 7 percent as the airline slashed its projections for new aircraft deliveries from Boeing in 2021 for the third time. 
China's largest auto show open in Beijing, with the biggest names showing off their latest electrical vehicles, underlining how the world's largest auto market is already in an all-electric state of mind and isn't looking back. China's largest auto show opened in Beijing on Thursday, and the biggest names showed off their latest electric vehicles, underlining that in the world's largest auto market, all electric cars are the future and there's no looking back. Automakers are set to unveil 117 new models, up from 93 at last year's show in Shanghai. And overall, 278 new energy vehicles will go on display, which is seven more than last year. The show comes after sales of such cars hit a milestone in early April. Data showed they accounted for over half of cars sold in China. Shipments have been getting a boost from a year-long price war that has sapped profit margins, as automakers strive to keep up by announcing newer, cheaper models and promotions. Crowds flooded the booths of Chinese manufacturers such as BYD and industry newcomer, phone maker Xiaomi. Its CEO said locked in orders for the sporty SU7 sedan, its first car, had hit over 75,700 and that buyers included owners of cars from brands like BMW and Audi. Foreign automakers have been scrambling to reset their China strategies and catch up with the electric shift. At the show, they touted plans to invest more in local production and research, with Japan's Nissan and Mazda unveiling cars tailored for Chinese drivers. Well, that'll do from all of us at the Nile Business Report. Thank you very much for your company all throughout this week. I'm Sina Maya Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you here on Monday. Good night.